Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Let me check. I know this. OK, great. Let me, uh, I noticed that, uh, I believe that you cannot um, type in text in the uh, in the chat box. Let me just check this. OK, I think should be done now. Uh, could you please check if you can uh, type in uh, something in the text box? OK, great. Now it works. Perfect. Great. So welcome to this uh, webinar. It's about artificial intelligence and how it is used in automation. Um, so this is what we'll uh, covering today. So I see now we can uh, type in the checkbox. Uh, great. So what we'll be doing is I'll go through these uh, slides in the webinar and at the end, if you are okay, we can, uh, we can spend a few more minutes on questions and answers. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let's do this. So what we'll be covering today is the, um, uh, what is artificial intelligence? Cl clarifying what is artificial intelligence, and then um, some terms that are used. What people use in terms uh, when they they talk about artificial intelligence or machine learning. Uh, finally, what do we do? How or how, how you do you build a system, an artificial intelligence based systems, and case studies? We'll look at different case studies. Case studies. Okay, so I'm just configuring something here, and we can we can start. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Now, uh, please note that um, I, I, will not, uh, I will not be able to look at uh, the, um, the, uh, the text, uh, the, uh, so the chat, throughout the uh, webinar. So um, I will just look at it at, at the end, if you are OK, so that we can uh, answer questions. OK? Now, first of all, a few words about Myself, I'm based in Spain, Barcelona, Spain, and I spent like the last 20 years or more than 20 years in artificial intelligence. I started initially with the first system in artificial intelligence in 1998 uh, that I built in the past. Um, I was uh, trained as an electrical electronic engineer, and then I went into computer science where I discovered um, artificial intelligence and uh, since then I was just in in, the, in this domain um, currently I uh, do lecturing at EIT I do some consultancy in in artificial intelligence and a family business I deal with a family business in dairy processing so this is basically what uh, what I what I do I had the chance to work with artificial intelligence in the past as an engineer to build systems, uh, as an entrepreneur. So I created a company in France and we uh, developed and sold technologies in, uh, in signal processing and uh, music recommendation, uh, which is based on artificial intelligence as a consultant and as a lecturer. So I had the chance really to see this world from different perspectives. So what is artificial intelligence? But before what is artificial intelligence, what is intelligence? Now we associate intelligence with humans, right? So this intelligence we associated with humans. Now, if we think about what is intelligence, let's take a look at how we can think about intelligence. Uh, we can think of it as having consciousness. So the fact that we humans 
seemed seem to be the only living organisms uh, who have a consciousness, who are aware of themselves, who can model themselves in the world and make predictions about the future. So they see themselves in the future. And it seems something really special to humans. So we can think of it as consciousness. But in this case, what about animals that we believe they are intelligent? So how do, do we consider them? Now here, what I'm saying, it's not that there's a clear definition or there's something wrong or right about how do we define intelligence. It is simply uh, to help you ask the questions or think about it. Okay, the idea is to think about it. So what is intelligence? Is it also solving complex problems? And if yes, what is a complex problem? Now, a complex problem could be seen as making calculations, just calculating 255 multiplied by 1,354 is a complex problem. For us, at least, it's very complex. But we can design systems that, that will do this much, much faster and better than we do. But we know that these are not intelligent. A calculator is not intelligent, or at least we think, we believe it's not intelligent. So um, complex problems. Now, if you, you, you think about what humans do, humans are really solving complex problems and they are the best in solving problems on the planet because they shaped the planet the way they wanted it to be shaped. No other animal was able to shape the planet as we can. So most probably we are the best problem solvers as humans. And later on, what we'll be uh, discussing is how can we build machines that could solve these types of problems that we can solve? Eventually, as good as we, uh, we can do it, but why not better? And then what is intelligent? Is it about making abstractions? So the way we think, we humans, we make abstractions and we conceptualize things and probably we are the only living organisms who can do this. Like you can create models, you can think about a, um, a problem around you and take a piece of paper, start drawing uh, by creating abstractions, connections, uh, finding relationships, finding patterns in what, what you see. And we are excellent at finding patterns. We humans are great at finding patterns. In fact, we are so good at finding patterns that sometimes, or even almost always, we find patterns where there are not to be found. And this is where we start um, explaining things that um, feel reasonable and logical to us, but there's nothing to explain. There are a lot of uh, phenomena that are simply random phenomena, and we try to explain them anyway. And this is a bias that we have, we humans. It is because we are good at finding patterns. Okay, so you look at something in front of you, you start connecting, you start uh, not correlating, you start seeing causal effects. If I see this, then that, which is very good for humans to, sur to, to survive and to develop. When you see like after um, the uh, uh, raining, so when, when it rains, and if you start counting that after raining, like one week or two weeks after rain, you start seeing plants growing, when you start defining this causal effect between rain and plants, this will be very helpful later on so that we can start connecting water and plant, and then we can actually uh, do irrigation. So it's very, very helpful for us. Okay, this correlation, finding patterns, correlations, and then causal effects. So if this is, or these are questions about intelligence, what's intelligence in general? which is what we, do, we, we say humans are, intelligent. Now, how do you gauge intelligent, uh, intelligence? How do you tell that something is intelligent? Well, there are different ways to gauge intelligence. For example, we might say that a, an agent, we are going to call these from now on agents. These agents could be an, an object, like a robot. It could be a software tool that just receives inputs and produces outputs. Uh, it's like you close your eyes and you talk to someone. How do you know that this person is really there, existing? They will listen to what you say and then they respond. So you hear them. 
without actually seeing them, without touching them. Okay, or talking, you are talking to someone on, on the phone. Um, well, you, it's, it's like there's a software agent somewhere who is receiving your inputs and who is responding. Okay, so we are going to call these agents. So as mentioned, not necessarily with, with hardware, with a physical existence, although they can be physically existent. It's not problematic. It's just you need a kind of body and then you put the intelligence within this body. So uh, first test is act like a human. You would say that an agent is intelligent if it knows how to act like a human. And there's a test here called the Turing test. It's a famous test to test whether a system is intelligent or not. Where you would have a judge, a human judge, sitting here, communicating with an agent. The judge does not know if the agent is a human or a machine and will communicate, will, will ask it questions, will respond, okay, and we see the responses and we'll try to create a conversation with the agent. Now, if the agent tricks the human and the human does not know if it's a, if it's uh, that it is a machine or it's not a human, then we'd say it passes the Turing test. Okay, so this is here gauging intelligence by gauging how well we act as a human or how well the agent acts like a human. Now, chatbots that you have, in fact, they fall in this category. Like you chat with a chatbot, you still clearly can see that it's not a human. You can trick it, you see it's not a human, but you notice that it's getting there. It's really getting close to how a, go, how a human responds. You can kind of carry, to some extent, you can carry a conversation with the chatbot. So this is the Turing test or gauging intelligence by seeing how close we are acting to a human. And then intelligence, you can gauge it by a, um, how rational we are or how rational the, the agent is in acting. An agent, for example, that is doing the right thing, we can consider it as an intelligent agent. An agent, for example, that will let you maximize your uh, probability of achieving your goals, that will let you optimize your production in a plant, is an intelligent agent. So optimization is part here, is, is at the core of what you, would, what you would call an agent that acts rationally. A controller, a feedback controller, is an agent that acts rationally, like a controller that will keep the car on, on the road. And when, when the car deviates from the road, it will put it back again on the road. This is a feedback controller, most probably, that is used. And it does something that we humans do when we drive a car, when we see that it's uh, drifting away, we put it again on the road, on, in, within the lane. Well, we can design systems that can do something similar. And in this case, the system is acting rationally. It does not even have to act like we, we, we humans do. The important thing is that it does the right thing. And then you can gain intelligence for an agent if it thinks like a human. So we emulate how the human thinks. And this is where um, computer science on one side, neuroscience on the other side will, will interact. Um, because the... Um, there's a lot of knowledge, recent knowledge about how the brain works, how we humans think, including knowing that it is composed of neurons. And these neurons are connected together. So these are cells that are connected together to create neural networks. And that the way we make decisions, the way we recognize things, we recognize an object or we recognize a sound or we decide to do something is basically by applying these neural networks. So we receive inputs. The inputs that we receive could be sounds or the sights, so the lights that we receive in, from uh, in our eyes. All of this is converted into some electrochemical signals that will enter into our brain and the cortex and then manipulated. So the signal will start traveling from one neuron to the other neuron to other neuron. And then there are a lot of them. We'll see in a moment how many. There are really a lot of them. So the signal starts. So this is the input, the signal. 
And finally, it's firing, it's an output of a certain neuron or a group of neurons that will let us make a decision. Okay? So when you design systems or if you design an agent that thinks like a human or tries to solve problems as we believe humans are solving problems, well, this is, we can call it an intelligent agent. Okay? And you can go really far, such as with the objective of um, probably completely copying a human brain. It's eventually possible in the future. You completely copy the human brain. Like you scan all of the connections between the neurons and then eventually you see what happens. Like you put a human brain on a computer. And finally, you can gauge intelligence by um, evaluating how rational or a, 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 an agent thinks, not acts rationally, it's how it thinks. For example, applying logic, applying mathematics, okay? Like something like uh, all humans are mortal, okay? I am a human and I can deduce that I am mortal, right? This is applying logic. So, uh, and we clearly believe that people or that any agent who can apply these types of, of logic is intelligent. I um, imagine that you have an agent who can solve uh, or provide proofs in mathematics or apply logic like, applies logic like this. So you can, you can consider it as an intelligent agent. Okay? But here we should be careful that not all intelligent behavior is in reality based on logical deliberation, including intuition. If you have expert intuition, it's not at all a logical deliberation, which is something that if you have an expert who is intelligent, say a medical doctor that will look at the patient in the eyes will touch the patient and will say, I, I think I know what, what you have, okay? The, this uh, medical doctor in this case is using their experience and we believe that they are intelligent when, we, when they do so, so, especially if they are right. Well, this is not usually logical deliberation. It's the intuition, it's kind of feeling, okay? It's not necessarily logical deliberation. So we should be aware of this. So now we saw what is, or we, we started asking questions about what is human intelligence? What is intelligence? How do we gauge intelligence? So if ever we created a artificial intelligence, intelligence that's not biological intelligence, how can we gauge it? And we saw that there are different ways. Either you act like a human, you act rationally, or you think like a human, or you think rationally. Now, a distinction to be made also between what's called a weak AI, artificial intelligence, and strong AI. Now, artificial intelligence is creating systems or agents that have this intelligence that we've, we've mentioned before, uh, but we create them. It's not naturally existing. It's not in a human. So this is artificial intelligence. Now, weak AI is about solving problems one set of time. Okay? And we don't really care if we are thinking like a human or not. We just solve problems, like an optimization problem. I want to uh, produce the right, the, the right um, ratio of products so that I optimize my profits in an organization. Okay, And I have a system that will help me do so. I would use a system that will let me predict what should be the sales in, in the next few months. And I'm going to use this information to plan in advance how, how we'll be doing prediction uh, production. Well, this is a weak AI. I can use intelligent systems in this case that will probably act rationally, uh, that will eventually think rationally, but do not necessarily think like a human. Okay, this is weak AI. So solving problems one at a time. Strong AI is when we solve, um, so, probably you solve all problems that the human can solve at least at the same level as the human. We think like a human, we act like a human. Okay? This is what you would call a, a strong AI. 
Now, fantasies about AI in movies is basically uh, about strong AI, where you see robots that act like us, uh, killing robots and other similar, similar examples, okay? Like Westworld, for example, series, Westworld series, really an excellent series if you can, if you can watch it, okay? Um, it's, it's really about strong AI. Now, today, as of today, we are not in the strong AI level. We are more at the weak AI level. So we are able to solve problems. If you look at them one by one, the, 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 the system or the machine that you create will do the job better than the human, but the same machine cannot solve all problems that a human can solve at their level. Okay, so we are, we are still not yet at the level of a human, a complete human uh, intelligence, okay? But it doesn't mean that we will not get there. And this is why you have people kind of worried about getting there because the day you create a system that is able to do everything that we do better than we, how we do it, it might, uh, might be dangerous to us. But it's, it's a story on its own. Now, in terms of artificial versus human intelligence, if you look at what constitutes human intelligence, so what we know is intelligence in humans, the computing is done by the neurons in our brains. And we have about 100 billion of them, 100 billion neurons. Storage, so the memory, so when you say storage is memory, like uh, your memories, the, uh, when you, you, you learn how to do things, it's stored. When you have an experience and you can recall this experience, it's stored. So storage is in the neurons and in the connection between neurons. So if we have a neuron, 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 so these are neurons here, they are connected together, they are linked together, such as one neuron will trigger, will fire, will generate a signal. The other neuron who is connected to it will receive the signal. And then we continue. This is what, what's happening. Now, these connections that we see here between neurons are called synapses, synaptic connections. Synapses. Okay, they connect the neurons, and these here are neurons. The, the way data is stored in our brains is basically in these, these synapses and how strong they are because the connections between neurons could be strong or could be weak. Like if it's strong, the new, when one neuron triggers, the other neuron will feel it strongly, will feel this trigger or this firing strongly. If the connection is weak, it wouldn't. Okay. And how strong and how weak these are, in fact, they are changing. When we start learning things as humans, in reality, what's happening is that these weights are changing. How strong neurons are connected are changing. This is how we learn. And this is how data is being stored in our brain. So storage is in our neurons, about 100 billion of them, and in the synapses of the connection between them that are a thousand times more. Okay, a factor of 1,000 times. So 10 to the power of 14 synapses. Now, cycle time, computing cycle time, so to do a computation, like the neuron will receive an input and will produce an output. The, the time it takes, it is in the milliseconds. It's really slow. And yet, you, you show to a human an image of a cat, they can immediately identify that this is a cat. You show it to a computer, it will take probably more time. Okay. Now, if you look at computers, the um, carbon-based intelligence, if you want to call it carbon-based intelligence, here we have transistors uh, as the, uh, the main cells who, who are doing computation. You have about 10 to the power 9 of them, okay, in the billions of transistors. Storage in the hundreds of billions in terms of bits of RAM that you use. But cycle times are much, much, much faster. Here we are talking in the nanoseconds instead of the milliseconds. So as you can see here, in terms of comparison between a human and a machine, machine can do 
cycle times of computation is much, much faster than humans. But in humans, you have distributed processing, so a huge amount of uh, neurons and a huge amount of connections between them. Okay? And it's very flexible. The key, the key point about the, the way humans or our brains deal with things is that it's flexible. It is designed to receive for it, uh, a signal that is corrupted and then there's a lack of signal. It's designed to do so. In machines, we have to really carefully design software that can deal with missing data, for example, or a bit that is um, incorrectly received. Okay, so it's let's say it's less flexible. And as you might imagine, the human can solve problems. The variety of problems that the human can solve is still more than the variety of problems that one a single machine can solve. So where we are right now in terms of artificial intelligence, we have autonomous vehicles, almost there. So almost able to drive in, in the wild. You have facial recognition, very effective, and it works quite well. Um, and it's really being deployed in, in many, many areas. Speech recognition, people use it probably all the time nowadays with smart assistants, smart speakers, and the likes. Virtual assistants, also included in those smart speakers and smartphones. Forecasting, in a lot of applications, you would have forecasting being used. We'll see examples in a moment. Medical diagnosis, so you give to a machine, you give it uh, an MRI image or an X-ray, and it will do a diagnosis based on it. In fact, there are many areas where a machine does better than a trained doctor. Okay? Then it becomes more why it's, it's not replacing medical doctors. It is more politics than technical. Okay? But machines can do better job in many areas in diagnosis than a human. Now, just before we continue, let's clarify some, some terms that are used. So here, what we talked about was, so we call it artificial intelligence, okay? AI. Now, part of AI is called machine learning, ML, machine learning. So let's clarify what is machine learning. Because this is a term that we see being used a lot. So machine learning is the ability of a machine to learn from data in the sense that it can go beyond any initial program that you program it with, which is exactly what we humans are. If, if you think about our DNA is our program, well, we went beyond what the program is meant or tells us to do. The program told us how to think and then we learn, we adapt. So if you think about it, this is exactly what we are doing. So our program is in our DNA and we are able to learn, we adapt. So machine learning is something similar where we create a program on a computer, but we do not tell it exactly what it should, it should do all the time in all cases, we will let it learn. For example, I can create a system that knows how to distinguish between a male and a female from their voices, male, female. Okay, male versus female. Now one can de develop a, a program by analyzing the sound signal and finding specificities that will distinguish a male from a female, and then you would have your program. But this program will work only to distinguish between males and females. It's not machine learning. If you create another program that, that is about classifying sounds in general, whatever the sound is, where you give it data, you tell it, here's a male and here's a female, learn from it. And then you ask it later on, what do you think about this voice? And then they will tell you this is a male or this is a female. This is machine learning. The same program, you give it now um, uh, samples of, of sounds from gunshots and babies crying and dogs barking, and the same system will now learn how to distinguish between a dog barking or a baby crying or a gunshot. This is machine learning. So the program 
is the basis. In fact, it tells the machine how to learn, but then the machine will start learning, learning to solve new problems, okay? This is machine learning. So in machine learning, we always rely on data. We need data. We need to learn from this data so that we can solve problems. If you give us different data, we'll learn to solve eventually different problems or the same problem in a better way. In learning, you have what's called supervised learning. Supervised learning, as the name will indicate, it is supervised learning. You supervise the learning of the machine or of the agent. It's like if you are um, helping a child to learn distinguishing between cars and bicycles. What you do, you show to the child, say, pictures where there are cars, and you tell, this is a car, and this is a bicycle. This is a car. This is a bicycle. So you give to the child the input, the input, which is the image here, and the output, what is expected to be the output, which is the class, the category. This is a car or this is a bicycle. This is the training part. Once it's done, you give to the child or the child will see a car on the road. They can generalize from what, we, what they learned before and then they will tell this is a car or this is a bicycle. This is supervised learning. So the same will be done with machines where we give the machine the signal, the input, like an image, like a sound, like a measurement of from a sensor or from different sensors. And we tell it, when you see this, you should say that. If you see this type of image, you should say, here's a cat. If you see this type of image, you, say, you should say, here's a dog. Or if you see these measurements from temperature, humidity, pressure, etc., you should say it's good outside or it's, um, it's hot outside or you should go and play outside. Otherwise, you should say stay at home. Okay, this is supervised learning. And once we learn, once the, the agent learns, then we can ask it. We can give it now the inputs like an image and we can ask it, what do you think we have here? You give it a sound. Is it, we can ask it, for example, what do you think the class is? And the machine will tell you it's a gunshot, for example. This is supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is when we do not supervise the learning. We give the machine or the agent the data and we ask it to find patterns in the data. Like the machine will group customers together. We'll say, okay, this, this group of customers seems to be, seem to be similar. So let me group them together. Clustering is basically unsupervised learning or creating recommendations, for example. The machine will just look at the behavior of different customers, what they consume, and from what they consume, it will start recommending. So if it sees that I'm not watching a certain movie and it believes that other people who are like me are watching this movie and are, they are liking this movie, so it will recommend it to me. Or if it sees that when people buy uh, wine, they typically buy cheese with it, and I buy wine, it will tell me, you should buy this cheese. So this is unsupervised learning, finding patterns in the data. And then you have what's called reinforced learning. Here, you would have an agent that will interact with the environment. It will interact with the world. Think of it as a robot. It will interact. It will do anything possible it can do like create sounds, push things around, etc. And when it interacts, the environment will either punish it or will give it rewards. And the agent wants to increase its rewards, like pleasure. It wants to increase its pleasure. Okay? So with learning, with trying, it's like trial and error. When, when it, it will continue trying and trying, trying always to increase their pleasure, uh, it will come up with strategies in the environment. Like we know, for example, we have to eat. Okay? So this is what you would call reinforced learning. Now, some examples. Supervised learning. A supervised learning could be a classification, meaning you want to provide a, a uh, class, a label, to a certain input. Like in here, sound. This is sound signal. Okay? a sound signal and you classify it, you label it. You say, this is a gunshot or this is speech, for example. 
This is a classification. The, the label is speech or music or a gunshot or whatever. The input is a signal that you receive from a microphone. Here, this is um, handwriting recognition. So I would write six, eight, and the machine will say, this is a six and this is an eight. Okay, here, image. For example, let's say we want to, um, to classify to see if there's a human inside or not. So human or not, or a human face or not. The machine will look at these images, the input are the images, and the output is, is there a face or not? It's a classification. Here, there's text, like writing index, who is the founder of Apple? The classification will say, so to classify Apple, we say it's an organization. It's not a fruit, it's an organization. This is a classification problem. And it's all, in all of these cases, it's supervised. Meaning first, you have to give to the machine the inputs, these are, all of these are the inputs and the outputs, what you expect it to say. This is a supervised classification problem. There's another term that's called regression where the output is not a category, it's not a class. The output is a number that you want to predict. Okay, like for example, I would want to predict that um, what is the electricity demand out in a certain city or a certain country given some information. This is called regression. So you give, for example, the day, the hour, the month, the temperature, and you want to predict the electricity demand. The output here is not a class. It's not a category. It is a number. It could be a category if you make them like low demand, medium demand, high demand. It could be something like this, or it could be a number that you want. If it's a category, you call it classification. If it is a number, you call it regression. So the output is a continuous number. Okay. So now, once you train the system, this is supervised learning. You give it all these examples from the past that you saw, for example. Okay. What was the electricity demand given this type of information? Uh, then you, you can ask us the question. You can say, if I have this information, what would be the electricity demand? This is regression. So you can see a regression in in forecasting, in pricing models, in performance models, weather. Give you an example very common in, in projecting or estimating costs of projects. In fact, you can do regression. For example, you have certain projects, say construction projects. And you know that in construction projects, uh, probably the area or the surface that you want to, to, to build, how num the number of stories that you have, stories number, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, and some other um, uh, factors will affect the cost, okay? And you did a lot of projects in the past. You, you are within an organization that does building, that builds things. Okay, so in the past, you, you have gathered all of this data. So what was the area, how many um, stories, bedrooms, bathrooms, et cetera, and what was the cost? You can create a system, it will learn, and then later on, it will let you predict. It will give you, usually it will give you very good estimates of what will be the cost of a project, because you probably know that the, um, usually it's not easy for us to come up with uh, predictions about the cost of a project, even if we do the details, usually people will add always a kind of reserve in the budget, like plus 10%. And usually people will consume these plus 10%. This means that from the beginning, we did not do a good job in the, in the estimation. Now, if you use these types of models, um, it can, it can um, be very, very helpful. Okay, so learning from the past, from historical data to predict what will be the cost in, in a certain project. You have in uh, supervised learning some uh, special applications that's called time series analysis. In time series analysis, you predict the future from the past and from some other external factors, but you mainly look at the past, okay? Like stock market predictions, economic forecasting. In unsupervised learning, this is where, as mentioned, we do not tell the machine what it should find. We ask it to find whatever it finds. For example, we give to the machine a set of humans. 
We are representing humans by their height and their mass, height and mass, height and mass. And the, the machine will plot them like this. Let's say here's the, the, the mass and here's the height. And we'll plot them as uh, 180, 80. Let's say here's the first human, uh, 160, 53. That's the second human. This is the third human. And this is the fourth human. Okay. And the machine will say automatically, I believe that there's a group here and a group here. And eventually later on, we will label them as males and females, for example. Okay. So this is finding clusters. So machines can do this. And there are algorithms that, that are really excellent at clustering, automatically clustering the data. And they are applied, for example, to uh, cluster clients that you have, consumers. You have a group like this. It will analyze them, analyze information about them, uh, about their profiles, and will group them in different groups. So now when you have groups of customers, it will be very helpful in a marketing campaign. You know that you should talk to these people in a different way than you should talk to these people or to these people. And it could really make a difference in a marketing campaign or in a recommendation of a product, for example. Also in un unsupervised learning, it's the way we might, it could be supervised and unsupervised learning here, the way we represent knowledge. For example, representing knowledge could be in a decision tree. We analyze previous decisions that human made and we create automatically a decision tree. We try to understand how the humans could do or even better. We can find a decision tree that would be better. A decision tree would be basically is basically asking questions. Is it raining outside? Yes. Then you ask another question. Is it cold outside? Yes. And if yes, so let's wear a jacket and let's let's take a uh, a coat, for example. Okay. So it's always asking questions, and based on the answers, we'll we'll eventually ask other questions until it gives you a final decision, a final action to take. Uh, so you can represent knowledge like this, represent knowledge of experts as decision trees. And in terms of re reinforcement uh, learning, so they have an agent, as mentioned before, that will interact with the world, it will observe the world. So it uses sensors to observe the world. And it acts, it uses actuators. And it tries to maximize its encouragements. Okay, so because the environment will be punishing it or encouraging it of doing certain actions, it wants to maximize its encouragement. And this is reinforcement learning. Now, how do you build a system? So what are the steps to build a artificial intelligence based system? In supervised learning, always you start with data gathering. Once you have the data, you have to pre-process it. Almost always, the data that you are able to gather will be noisy data, and you'd have to deal with it. You have to clean it. So this is called data pre-processing. You have to label the data, typically even manually. You take data and you manually label them, like this is an image that contains a cat or that contains a dog. Labeling is essential in supervised learning because you want to supervise what, what will be learned. And then you select certain features from the data that you have, from the measurements that you have, you modify them, you change them. And this is really a lot of, a lot of work. It is, it is essential when designing a system. Then you select a model and you train it and evaluate it once you are ready. If you believe that it's good enough, you deploy it. In unsupervised learning, also we start with the data. Data gathering, data pre-processing. Here we do not label the data, we just select the features, but we have to do something different here. We have to define what is similar, define what, how do we measure similarity between two data points, between two profiles. Okay, so we have to define this. Once we are done, we model our, uh, so we train our model, we evaluate and we deploy. In reinforced learning, we have to define what is an environment, what are the sensors? What are the actuators that are available to our agent? We define what's a state, what's the current state of the environment, of the world. What is performance? 
So what do you really want to achieve, which is the best possible state in the world? Like a clean, uh, a, it could be a reinforcement learning. You might want to train a vacuum cleaner. And for you, the performance is the best possible uh, room that you can have, a clean room, you're consuming the less possible power. Okay? And then you define a reward strategy. How do you punish and how do you reward? For example, you would reward this vacuum cleaner. Each time it will suck dirt. And you would punish it if it doesn't. And you would punish it if it consumes more energy than or uh, each time it consumes energy, you would punish it, for example. Okay? Evaluate your system and deploy. Now, what kind of techniques you might see in these, when I say models that are used and you train those models, what kind of systems do, do we have? So the, um, the, the techniques that we have are very common here, artificial neural networks. They are inspired by how the human works, the brain works. And then you have K nearest neighbors, very, very simple method. Uh, things like support vector machines, Gaussian mixture models, hidden Markov models, expectation maximization, K means clustering. This is for clustering. Genetic algorithms, very interesting algorithm here inspired by evolution. So it creates um, individuals and those individuals will couple and it creates generations, really inspiring. But let's concentrate just on some of them uh, to give you an idea. In artificial neural network, which is like this, it is, as the name indicates, artificial neural network. It tries to predict outputs here from inputs. The inputs are the signals. It defines neurons. And the connection between neurons are abstract. In fact, they are weights that are given. And this is an artificial neural network. The neuron itself is a simple representation. It's just going to calculate the weighted sum of its inputs and apl applying some function on it. This is a neuron. And you will be surprised that with this simple architecture, you can really solve very complex problems, which is in fact inspired by how the, the, the brain works. K nearest nerve neighbor is a classification uh, algorithm, very simple, just simply says, the class of this point is the class of it is neighbors. Here it is. And you'll be surprised how well this simple system works. Okay? Just if you want to classify an object, see who are its neighbors and what's the majority class, and then give it the same class of the majority class. Now, now getting to tools, what do you use today if you want to build a machine learning system with artificial intelligence and the like? You might probably use Python including libraries like scikit-learn and tensorflow you might use a software like Wicca. we'll see it in a moment matlab or cloud-based solutions from ibm from google from microsoft from amazon so here they built these algorithms you have to load your data configure the algorithms and you get the results now python and in particular if you start tensorflow with, within it it will let you build really advanced machine learning software uh, algorithms and models and start the work. Here's an example. We are not going to get into the details of programming, but just to show you how relatively easy it is to create a system that will classify images. Here it is. This is the code. You load the data. You split the data into training and testing. Every image is it has an image and a label. The labels are here, like a bag, ankle boot, dress, etc. Some plotting here of the images so that you can see them. Here they are. Okay, these are examples. Everyone, you have the input. The input is here. The class is this. This is the class, the output. And then here's the actual code. Create the model like four lines of code, compile, fit, and you're done. You created a machine learning model. And now you will give it an image. It will tell you what's the class. Another tool is this one here, Weka. You can see the, uh, the link where you can download it from. It's an excellent tool because it has a graphical user interface. It will allow you to load your data in this 
format here. It's simply just a comma separated values format where in these comma separated values, you should have the inputs that you have, the inputs like your measurements and the outputs, the class or the value that you want to predict in regression. You, you load it there and you can apply all of these algorithms that we've mentioned before. And you can see, you can build your own system. Very, really very simple to use. You can use also MATLAB, a commonly used software by engineers and scientists. Also, it will let you create a model. So here, just I select what type of model I want, the architecture of this model, load the data in it, and I would have my model. So creating models and machine learning tools today is not really very complicated. So whether you use Python, MATLAB, there's R also that you can use, Weka or Cloud, all of this is, is really simple to use. Now, unless you want to do, build things from scratch, this is where you would write your code from scratch, but most probably people will start with these, these tools first, okay? And you can deploy a complete system using these tools. So depending on what kind of experience you have, what to, for example, if you are already working in MATLAB, you would probably use MATLAB to build a machine learning tool, okay? Now here are case studies in automation. Because artificial intelligence and machine learning is used in many, many areas, okay? And just in automation. Some examples without details, just to show you what you can do with them. Predictive maintenance, predictive control, fault detection, recommendations, and creating assistance. Predictive maintenance. Here's, in fact, it's from a paper that, um, that we did at EIT with a, a student and a master. Um, engines, so these are um, aerodirective engines. So there are sensors within them that are doing some measurements. And this data goes to a a computer where it's stored. The idea was to detect a certain types of faults that are not easy to detect unless you are under maintenance. You open up the whole engine and you maintain it. And if you run the engine without repairing it, it will not be efficient. You will not operate at it in, in an efficient way. So the idea was to use some measurements, these measurements, use a neural network and provide an output, which is the probability of failure or probability of a certain fault. And uh, it worked really very, very well. In fact, it detected all possible faults. On historical data for years, it detected all possible faults. So this is an example where you would use, in this case, an artificial neural network to solve a specific problem, which is predictive maintenance. So we predict in advance when this uh, maintenance operation should take place because we will be failing later on, okay? Predictive control. This is a predictive control in boilers. Boilers in particular in what's called the boiler drum. So the drum like this where you have water and water is boiling and steam gets out and water gets in. So this is creating steam, right? It's just to heat in, in a drum, you heat water, it boils, steam is generated. You want to keep the level at a certain point in this drum. It might seem simple to control, but it's not. So um, one, one, one uh, method that was used is to predict, given the current situation, what would be the level of water in the next minute or so. And it was included within a controller. And here it's called a feedback controller, where the predicted level was combined with the current level to make a decision. And it worked also quite well. So at every moment, there was a prediction what would happen in the future, given the current conditions. Here's another example. So all of these are examples in industrial automation. This is another example where the objective was to um, detect faults in uh, electric motors. And these are for bearing faults in the electric motors. The input was vibration data, and the output was the fault and also worked very, very well. Here it uses also neural networks. So in all of these cases, neural networks were used. Here's an example to predict or to forecast electricity demand in Spain. The data is available and you can build a system relatively easily to predict uh, the, uh, the consumption in the future. 
also here in this in this particular case, uh, uh, what I personally used is a neural network. Here's another case to predict solar radiation. Given the inputs, here's the architecture. It's a neural network, and it will predict solar radiation. And finally, an example. This system here was trained on um, conversations from movies. So um, I built this system. I trained it on millions of turns of conversations from movies. The only thing that it was trained on is you give it the input, the turn from like actor one, and the output is actor two, what actor two says. This is it. You train it to like generate what actor two responded to what actor one said. And you have databases that will allow you to do so. So millions of turns were, were used to create a neural network. It was called here recon neural network. And here's the conversation. This is what I asked the system, Q, and what the system responded. And there's no, there are no rules at all. It's nothing programmed in it. It's just training. And this gives you an idea of uh, what you can do. So if I say hi, the system said, hi there. Where were you last night? I was in the bathroom. What's your name? My name? Yes, your name, please. My name is John. How are you today? Fine, I'm doing great. Do you like to go out with me? Sure. I like you. I like you. I love you. You know that. I love you. Let's go grab a beer. Come on. And I got to go now. Bye. These responses, all of these responses were created by this recurrent neural network, as I mentioned, without any rule given to the system. So this is basically it. To, to summarize, you can use today artificial intelligence to solve real world problems, industrial problems, automation, in automation in particular, like the examples that we saw. If you have data, if you want to make predictions, and if you want to optimize operations, certainly there's something there that you can, that you can do. And this is it from my side. So. Um, if you, if you uh, we can take questions. Hi, Hardy. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. That's good. Sorry, um, sorry about the, the start of the webinar, um, Hardy and everyone. Uh, I was meant to, I was meant to be hosting from the start, but um, unfortunately, our office uh, network uh, wasn't, um, yeah, wasn't allowing me to to join Blackboard on any of the computers, so. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, um, there was a bit of a shaky start, uh, but thank you, Hardy, for, um, uh, for going ahead and starting the webinar. Um, now, I'm just going to change the slides briefly just to, um, just to end the session. Um, just give me one moment, please. And I'll also, um, I'll also be providing the uh, the link for the certificate of attendance um, as well. As I know a few people have been asking um, about that. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Hope you can all see the slides. Um, so this uh, this is our next um, webinar. So if you would like to um, if you would like to attend our next uh, technical webinar, um, it is on introduction to hazardous areas and um, hazardous areas classifications. Um, that one will be uh, be delivered by uh, Miss Alex Gregory. Um, she is one of our uh, lecturers at EIT, like Hardy. Um, and that will be in a couple of weeks time. So um, there will be a break next week. There's no no webinar scheduled for next week. Um, usually we have webinars almost every week now. <laughs> um, they've, they've become so popular. Uh, but um, yeah, for the next one, it will be it will be two weeks from now. 
and uh, you can register for that on our website on our events page and uh, I will be updating the website with more uh, webinars uh, very soon so um, so look out for that now uh, just to give you a quick overview um, so uh, our upcoming courses at EIT. Um, this is a this is a very brief overview of the courses that we offer. Uh, we have uh, professional certificate of competency courses, which um, are three month short courses. Uh, they run throughout the year. Um, we have diplomas and advanced diplomas. Um, they also run throughout the year. So for those courses, we have. Um, all different types, there's very, many, many different um, courses in different fields of engineering and uh, the intakes, uh, the start dates for those, um, they are different for every course. So the best way to look at those is to go to our schedule page on our website um, and that shows you all of our courses um, upcoming and uh, all of the available intakes um, for this year. So. Um, we have undergraduate uh, certificates and bachelor's degrees starting on the 25th of July, um, as well as our Doctor of Engineering. Um, so those are all of our online uh, versions. Uh, we also have graduate certificates and master's degrees starting on the 27th of June, uh, also online version. Um, we also we also have on-campus um, courses as well. So if you're you're interested in studying on-campus with us in Australia, um, we have on-campus courses starting on the first of August. So that's our bachelor's, master's, and doctor of engineering programs, um, and we have two campuses uh, in Perth in and in Melbourne. Now. Um, so this is the certificate of attendance link. Uh, let me provide you with um, the link in the chat box. Uh, if you've got your smartphone, however, um, please um, please feel free to scan the QR code on the screen there. Um, I'll also post the link in the chat box now. There you go. Um, so basically, that that link or the QR code will take you to a short form or survey that you need to complete uh, if you would like to receive a certificate of attendance for this session. Um, our, our certificates uh, will, will be sent uh, likely tomorrow. Um, thanks Eunice, sorry we, 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 don't, we don't actually need anyone's uh, email addresses. Um, if you just if you just go when you fill out the form if you can make sure your email address is correct um, when you fill out the form, um, those certificates will be sent to you sometime tomorrow within the next business day. Um, so if anyone would like a certificate of attendance for this session, please please feel free to uh, go ahead now and, uh, and fill out the form by scanning the QR code or uh, clicking the link I've posted in the chat box. Um, I will note as well, um, uh, uh, quite excitingly, uh, this um, uh, for the first time, for the first time, uh, with this uh, with this certificate of attendance, um, we will be providing a um, a five percent discount for our um, for some of our professional certificate of competency courses, our three month short courses. Um, I will provide more details when I send out the uh, the certificates tomorrow. Um, so you can go through that, um, but uh, we will have a few courses there that you can get um, five percent off. Um, so uh, if if you're if you're interested in that, then um, then then go ahead and uh, request a certificate of attendance. Um, so that pretty much concludes the the webinar. Thank you so much for um, presenting, Hardy. It was a great presentation. I I, I was able to join um, shortly after you started uh, you started presenting, um, and I watched most of the uh, most of the webinar. It was it was great. Thank you very much, um, and I'm sure everyone um, in the session really appreciated it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just leave the last slide up with all of our contact details. 
Um, so if you do need to go, um, thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Um, it's a pleasure to have you uh, join us. Um, but otherwise, um, as as Hardy mentioned before, uh, we will we will take questions. So if anyone has any technical questions for Dr. Hardy or um, or general questions about EIT or our courses, um, I can answer those as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave those I'll leave those um, contact details up there for you. Um, now the the uh, the slides and the video recording of this webinar will be sent automatically to you via email tomorrow. So that is separate to the certificates. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance, um, click the link I've just posted in the chat box to fill out the form of the survey. But the um, the webinar recording and the slides will be sent to you automatically tomorrow. Okay, now, if anyone um, has any uh, questions, please put them in the chat box. Julius, um, uh, we do have a, um, we do have a page. Uh, I'm not sure as of uh, what, uh, what opportunities we may have available at the moment. But um, if you do go to our website, uh, you will find a um, careers page somewhere. Um, and, and yeah, uh, I'm not sure as uh, as of the moment if we if we do have any opportunities at the moment. But but, but feel free to to get in contact with us. And um, uh, if you if you would like, um, you can even uh, send me an email. My email address is on the on the screen. Um, Certificate of attendance. Again, um, I'll post the link in the chat box um, if anyone would like to request one. Uh, okay, I think we've got a couple of questions uh, for you, Hardy. Um, uh, we have a question: uh, Is it possible that one day AI will replace humans completely? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Riley. In fact. I, uh, I I took note to uh, several questions. Okay, oh, so let, let me just start probably from uh, early questions. I saw from Hossam sure. how to clean a data set in an array. So usually the clean is meaning normalization. You normalize the data and it means uh, fill in the missing data. And it's, it's really a complete technical domain on its own, how to uh, fill in the missing data and do the normalization. I saw a question from Mohammed about what is how to practically uh, learn machine learning and electricity. I would say do projects. Start with a simple, simple task, simple project, and do a project. Do a proof of concept. It's really the greatest, the best possible way to start learning. Well, and the, uh, the the tools that I mentioned are, uh, are are excellent to start, like Wika, for example. You can start there. Um, I saw also, uh, can AI replace humans one day? Personally, I would say yes. I would say yes. It can do whatever we can do. Um, can we train or AI to learn compassion and ethics? I also would say yes. Even if today it's not possible, but Yes, it, it should be. Um, Nicole, which classification technique do you recommend for classifying disease severity? Um, all of the, in fact, classification techniques, by the way, are less important to use than what you use as features. So it, it, it all starts with the features that you have. But uh, you can always start with artificial neural networks. They, they work well in a variety of applications. Like the, all the ones that we saw today, we've mentioned where about artificial neural networks. Uh, will AI really take all, over our jobs in the future completely? A good good part of our jobs, in, in fact, will be um, will be taken by uh, by AI. Okay. Um, for example, we mentioned medical diagnosis that uh, feels to be too human. Um, it's better done by by AI. We'll still have something to do. But uh, if AI does everything that we, that we want, like uh, growing what we have to eat and then helping us do whatever we, we have to do, then we can concentrate on eventually some other endeavors. But personally, I'm, 
I'm optimistic about it. It takes the jobs, but it doesn't mean that we'll be left out of money and out of food, in my opinion. Uh, human replacement is too dangerous. Yes, sure, but uh, but it's um, as as mentioned. The, the the reason why we do work from the beginning is to feel this fulfillment and the basic needs. Get the basic needs like eating and a shelter and the like. If you think about it, AI can eventually provide us with shelter and food and comfortable environment uh, one day automatically. So a lot of work could be done by AI built systems. Uh, and then Weka AI, I, I highly recommend Weka, really I highly recommend it, this software tool. It's not very commonly used by or popular as what people would use in Python. I don't know why. Personally, I recommend that if you want to start, start there with Weka. Um, okay, predictive maintenance. Uh, clearly, there are a lot of opportunities in predictive maintenance, but within a, an existing environment. So you should be already in an, in an organization where you do maintenance. You would evaluate the costs of maintenance that you have. And uh, predictive maintenance is basically about predicting when things will fail. A lot of opportunities there. But you need data, you need, uh, you need previous data, you need previous maintenance logs in general to be able to build a predictive maintenance system. Um, please, the work, is it easy to learn? Yes, yes, Julius. I, I would say it's, it's probably the easiest, okay? Okay, uh, Rumbi Zai, what happens if a program uh, um, that can rewrite its own code? Now we get into the safety of AI, AI safety. And there are even research in AI safety to ensure that um, AI cannot like rewrite its own code, such as it does whatever it wants and even harming us humans. Uh, it's safe. In fact, it's, I would say it's not different from building safety systems in engineering, the way we do it today. But it is, it's just like these are systems that are more advanced. Is computer vision also AI? In general, yes, it's based on, on machine learning a lot in computer vision, okay? So it's, it uses a lot of machine learning. Humans are more, okay, so if AI is created by humans, so the humans are more fundamental, so they, they're, there may be a, many approaches reduced in fields of modern works. So complete replacements by AI, is it possible? I invite you to think about what, what, what is so special about a human, for example, when they drive a car or when they plant seeds. Um, in the past, people thought that a lot of things cannot be, 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 be done by, by machines. And if you see today, a lot of these works are actually done by machines. Uh, and we are already kind of fusing humans and machines today. The fact that you use your smartphone all the time it's a fusing a human and a machine. A lot of tasks are already delegated that in the past we thought were very, very human tasks. Okay. Okay, another one, another intelligent, okay, uh, electronics. MATLAB should be available, exactly, if you are in the IT, yes, it should be available. For a beginner in AI to start modeling with, I, I would say a Weka. And let me just type in the Weka link here so that you can Weka download. Yeah. So that you would. Here we go. I'm just typing in the Weka link. Okay. So I believe we've covered all. Uh, all questions. We just had one more. Maybe we'll like make this one the last one, Hardy. Okay. Well, will AI affect the digital currency? Will it be safe leaving money in the hands of AI to manipulate? Now, I'm, I'm not familiar with how it will affect digital currency, but we are already relying on AI to manipulate money, in fact, in, um, in the stocks. 
stock market. It's already we are it, it, a lot of of uh, operations are already relying on AI. Thanks very much, Hardy. And uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that's all all we have time for today. Um, so thank you very much, uh, and um, have a good day, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, we hope to see you again, and um, hopefully uh, join us in um, another webinar in the future. Uh, but otherwise, all of our contact details are on the screen. So our website is there. Um, our schedule page is there. Uh, you can email me. So my email is webinars at eit.edu.au. You can email me if you would like to. Um, if you'd like to get in contact with me, and if I can't uh, answer it, then I will forward it on to who can. Um, now, and thanks, and thanks again, Hardy, for the presentation. And um, yeah, I'm sure everyone really appreciated it. If uh, and if anyone's still wondering, I will send the PDF slides and the video recording tomorrow, um, uh, as as uh, as well as the certificates, but they will be separate. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thanks, Hardy. See you next time.